Good afternoon. I got way too many pages here for how much time I have. Judges, chapter 13. We'll get right into it. I can't just say what she said. She said start with the last time. continuing our series on uh, Great Bible Events, and I don't think anybody will not recognize this story. Um, even as I studied it, though, I, I always find stuff, the Bible is such a wonderful thing, you always find things you didn't really catch the last time you read and studied the story. We're going to be talking about Samson, and I don't think anybody here doesn't know who Samson is. Samson was a big, strong guy, and uh, and we're going to focus on Samson, but instead of focusing so much on his strengths, we're going to kind of talk about his weaknesses. And we're going to talk about how Samson had to deal with some fatal flaws and how we in our life need to deal with some fatal flaws even in our own lives. You know, the, the great feats of strength that Samson performed may have been legendary, but it was his flaws that proved to be his fatal downfall. And the two greatest weaknesses in Samson's life were revenge and romance. You know, many times when you read the, the life of Samson, you find that his weakness for women is what often led him onto the road to revenge. He was an extremely gifted individual, and I don't think anybody would ever argue that. But you actually read the story of Samson, and it's hard to say that this is necessarily a wonderful, godly man when you read the story of Samson. He was strong on the outside, but he had a lot of weaknesses, and he had a big problem with self-control. And that's the, the issue with Samson. You know, a lot of times when we read the Bible and read all these stories about our wonderful favorite Bible characters, we look at like a Moses, or a Joshua, or a Gideon, or even a Hannah, or a Ruth, and we're, we say to ourselves, oh, I could never be like that. I could never fit in those shoes. But when you read the story of Samson, you're like, well, I can see myself like that. Yeah, I fly off the handle sometimes. Yeah, I lose control. I have problems in my life. Samson is someone more of us can relate to. You know, most of us know what it's like to be tempted. Most of us know what it's like to struggle and fall and fail. And we see that in the life of Samson. We see that he has all these problems, and we see uh, truth in his life. You know, that matches our life. We have our own problems. We may not necessarily have his problems, but we all have our own problems that give us uh, a thorn in our side, so to speak, that just gives us issues as we go along life. And one thing we can see in Samson's life that we can apply to our own is that when we allow sin to run rampant in our life, sometimes that sin is going to make us carry farther than we ever would on our own. And we see that in Samson's life. It took Samson further, his sin in his life, took him probably a lot further than he really wanted to go. Now I wanted to start off in chapter 13. You look at verse 1 and it says, And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines for forty years. Now the Philistines, they were a very warlike people. You trace their origin back to the land of Egypt, and they had remained the enemy of Israel for years. And God was using the Philistines to judge Israel at this time. And it's interesting that if you read in this, this specific place in the book of Judges, this is the one place where we don't find the Israelite people crying out to God for deliverance. Because the Philistines had a different game plan this time. The Philistines came in, and they conquered their enemies by assimilating them, by intermarrying with them, and they simply watched and happily watched as the religion of the Israelites kind of slowly disappeared as they mixed with the Philistine people. Now, does this sound familiar to us? Sounds very familiar with what's going on in our society today. The intermixing, the intermarriage, the way society is taking over our churches, and the impact of the Christian church is disappearing from our country today. And we see that uh, for this specific reason in Israelite's history and in the life of Samson, God had to step in. And he had to break through. 
You know, so God decided he appears to a man and his wife, and he tells them that they're going to have a son who is going to begin to deliver Israel from the Philistines. He told them about their son, Samson. This was a woman that had been barren and couldn't bear children, but, but she was told that she would bear a son, and it said that that son, even while he was in her womb, that son was to be set apart. He was to be a Nazarite. He was to take the Nazarite vow. You know, verse 5 is what tells us that. And if we go in and we look, Numbers chapter 6 is what tells us what that means, that he's a, to be a Nazarite. The Nazarite vow must... Um, there are certain things that they had to keep to during the period of their vow. He was to be a Nazarite all his life. So that meant for all of his life, he was supposed to do these specific things. The thing that it tells us that in number 6 is, first of all, he was to avoid any contact with grapes. At all, period. No wine, not even raw grapes. He's not supposed to eat anything that was from the fruit of the vine. Secondly, he was never to touch a dead body of any kind. And third, he had to let his hair grow and to never cut it. No razor was ever to touch his head. Those are the things that uh, Samson, as a Nazarite, was supposed to do. Now I want you to look in verse 5, and let me read what this says. The last phrase of verse 5 in chapter 13, it says... He shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. We can find it interesting to discover that Samson never really delivered Israel out of the hands of the Philistines. Why did Samson not really deliver them? Because he never really delivered himself from his own sin. And because of that, he wasn't allowed to actually be the deliverer, but he began the deliverance. He was to begin the deliverance of Israel. You can also see in in verse 25 of this chapter, where it says... And the Spirit of the Lord began to move him at times in the camp of Dan between Zorah and Eshtelah. We see that he was set apart. He was to follow the Nazarite vow. And the Spirit of God moved in him. So Samson had everything he needed to do, but yet he fell short. He had so much, but he let it slip away because of some of the flaws in his life. You know, chapter, chapter 14 starts to go into seven stupid things that Samson did. Seven, seven stupid steps that Samson took. First of all, he went to the wrong place. In verse 1, it says, Samson went down to Timnah. Why would he go down to Timnah? You know, here we're seeing this two, little, two things in this little phrase here. First of all, he's telling us something about geography. Timnah was south of where... Uh, and it was south into the actual Philistine territory. So he was actually leaving Israel's territory. It was about four miles down a ridge from the, vill- the village that Samson grew up in. But it also tells us symbolically a decline in Samson's spiritual life. You know, the very first public act that Samson was to perform, and it says that he was leaving the land of Israel for the land of the Philistines. So basically, he was, Samson left God's people and was heading south. Secondly, he was looking for the wrong thing. Verse 1 tells us, And Samson went down to Timnah and saw a woman in Timnah of the daughters of the Philistines. You know, he was looking for the wrong thing. And when he returned home, he told his parents in verse 2, he says, I've seen a Philistine, a Philistine woman. Now his parents tried to warn him about the dangers of intermarrying, of intermarriage and how she would uh, bring him down and bring him away from God. But we can read verse 2 and see how he responded. I mean, verse 3 and see how he responded. It says, Then his father and mother said unto him, Is there never a woman among the daughters of thy brethren, or among all my people, that thou goest to take a wife of the uncircumcised Philistines? And Samson said unto his father, very plain and simple, he says, Get her for me, for she pleaseth me well. You know, the Bible is telling us something here about Samson. That he's a man motivated by physical appearance. He looked on the woman and said, she's pretty, I want her. And that's what his motivation was. He saw this young woman, he saw that she looked good, and now he wants her for his wife. So Samson, first of all, was looking in the wrong place. He was looking for the wrong thing. And he was looking there for the wrong reason. The third stupid step is he rejected godly counsel. You know, this downward spiral continues, and it takes the worst turn it can because he ignores the godly counsel of his parents. Not only the godly counsel of his parents, but where did that godly counsel come from? That godly counsel came from the book of Exodus 34.16 where it warns them 
and also in Deuteronomy 7, warns about not marrying someone from the surrounding pagan nations. Because they were going to then, in, in turn, turn you away from God and turn you to go whoring after other gods, as it so speak, says. And so, the next thing we see him do, number four, is he continued a wrong relationship. In verse 7 of chapter 14, it says, And he went down and talked with the woman, and she pleased Samson well. So first of all, he told his mom and dad, I want you to make this woman my wife, but he had never really met her yet. Now he actually goes and gets to meet the woman, and he still likes her. So he continues in to, to this, uh, in this incorrect relationship simply because he's, he's hormone-driven. He's not fully spirit-driven. He saw a pretty girl, and she talked nice, and he thought she looked nice, and so he wanted that to be his wife. You, you can kind of equate this to the Old Testament version of the college bar scene, you know, where the young man walks up to a woman and says, Hello, I love you. Will you now tell me your name, please? Basically, Samson didn't even know who this woman was, but he just knew he was in love with her. Fifth, he compromised his commitment. What was, he committed, what was his commitment? The Nazarite vow that we went through. We talked about three different things of the Nazarite vow. And while Samson is traveling with his parents to make the wedding arrangements with this young Philistine woman, he goes into the vineyard. Well, he's not supposed to touch grapes. He's not supposed to drink wine. Why is he wandering into the vineyard? He shouldn't have been there. You know, and then while he's there, what does he encounter? He encounters a lion. A lion comes after him. And it says that he rent him in twain with his nothing in his hand. That means he killed the lion with his bare hands. If you kill something with your bare hands, you've touched the dead body. He wasn't supposed to touch dead bodies. And that's why the Old Testament tells us that he didn't even tell his mom and dad about this. You know, verse 6 notes that he didn't tell them. Why wouldn't he tell them? You'd think if your son had, if one of our sons had gone out and kill the lion with his bare hands, they'd be running home bragging to mom and dad, guess what I did today? But Samson didn't want to tell his mom and dad because he knew he had violated his Nazarite vow. In verses 8 and 9 it says, And after a time he returned to take her, this, this woman, and he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion. And behold, there was a swarm of bees and honey in the carcass of the lion. And he took thereof in his hands and went on eating and came to his father and mother and he gave them and they did eat. But he told not them that he had taken the honey out of the carcass of a lion. So here we have Samson traveling alone again. He stops by this vineyard and to see where this, the scene where he had killed this lion. And he finds the bees. He finds the honeycomb. He scoops out the honey. Once again, touching a dead body that he should not have contact with. And that's not all. According to verse 10, it says Samson made a feast. You read verse 10, it says, For so used the young men to do. He made a feast. Basically, Samson was having a bachelor party. The word feast, the, word, the Hebrew word that's translated into feast, actually implies a drinking fest. He was basically having a giant toga bachelor party here with all his best buddies. And here's a Nazarite who's not supposed to be drinking any wine, having a bachelor party, a drinking fest. So here we see Samson, a believer who's basically bailing out on all his commitments. Now if you take a look at Samson on the outside, you see his long hair and you see the way he's dressed, and he looks like a Nazarite. But he's not living as a Nazarite should live. You know, do we do that too many times as Christians? Do we look on the outside? Do we put out the show that we are living the Christian life, but in the inside when we're by ourselves, we're far from it? We need to make sure that we stay away from that. On the outside, Samson was a, looked like a man of God, but on the inside he was a man being controlled by his own desires and his own lusts. Number six, he ignored his weaknesses. You know, the time had come for the wedding. And so, in verse 11, we see on the, the day of the feast, they were having a seven-day wedding feast, and Samson begins off by offering a riddle to 30 Philistine groomsmen. You know, he was kind of trying to, to play fun with them. He's trying to pick a little fun at them. wanted to have a little battle of wits. And this riddle, of course, was referring to the honey that he had dipped out of the lion. 
And it says, if we look at verse 14, we see this riddle, where it says, He, he said unto them, Out of the eater came forth meat, and out of the strong came forth sweetness. And it says, And they could not in three days expound the riddle. They didn't understand the riddle that he had given them. So not only was Samson, he was kind of walking around with a little swagger to his to himself. He was feeling pretty proud of himself for fooling these people. So he put a little wager on top of the riddle. They had seven days to solve the riddle. And if they couldn't, they had to give him 30 changes of clothes. 30 new garments. If they could win the riddle, he'd have to give each one of them. Each one of the 30, he'd have to give them their own new change of garments. And as the feast days continued, the groomsmen were starting to get nervous. They couldn't figure this riddle out. So they approached Samson's bride, and as the uh, godfather would like to say, they made her an offer that she just couldn't refuse. In verse 15, we see this offer, which wasn't much of an offer. It said, And it came to pass on the seventh day that they said unto Samson's wife, Entice thy husband that he may declare unto us the riddle. Okay, now here's their off counter offer. Lest we burn thee and thy father's house with fire. Have ye called us to take that we have? Is it not so? Basically, here's 30 Philistine people that were called to come to the marriage feast as the groomsmen, and they were pretty much mad at the, the father and the, and the girl because you've called us in here to be your groomsmen, and now your, your uh, bridegroom is trying to take things away from us. We don't think that's very right, so if, if he's successful at it, we're going to burn you, your house, and your... And these were just not very nice people. Not the kind of people I would want to invite to my wedding party, particularly. And I wouldn't think you would not want to either. Now the Hebrew word that they use for entice there basically means to exploit the simple-mindedness of Samson. Samson was somewhat of a simple-minded person. And we see 20 years later, they're going to do the same thing with Delilah. They're going to ask Delilah to exploit Samson as well. Now Samson could be seduced because he was all hormones and he was no brain. He was not the brainiac kind of person. He was all the bronze. He was definitely the bronze of the bunch. And here's the sad part. Samson's weakness was apparent to everybody but himself. Samson was the only one who didn't recognize the fact that he had this weakness. He never saw his weakness. He refused to admit that he had it. And he never came to grips with it. And because of that, it was going to end up proving to be his undoing. Now eventually, he reveals the answer of the riddle to his wife. Or to his bride. And we can often see that it's sometimes in our own lives. It's a refusal to deal with our own weaknesses. The refusal to acknowledge the fact that we have weaknesses that causes us trouble and trials in our own lives as well. Many of us are just like Samson. Sometimes we'll do anything we can to avoid the real issue. I know I've seen that sometimes, and many of you who are parents have probably seen it in your children, where they'll put more energy into avoiding the task you ask them to do than just they would have if they had just done the task you've asked. Samson was the same way. And sometimes we're the same way. We're stubborn. We put more energy into avoiding our weaknesses and avoiding our troubles than we, do, than, than we would if we had just dealt with them when they came up. Now we see the seventh stupid thing that Samson does is he'd rather take revenge than repent. Well, because now the groomsmen knew the riddle and they came to Samson right at the last moment and told him his riddle. So Samson now had to buy them 30 garments. He had to provide 30 garments. Now Samson didn't really have 30 garments to give, so he had to come up with these 30 new garments. So what's his solution? Well, verse 19 tells us that in order to solve this problem, Samson goes in and kills 30 Philistines. Well, he just killed 30 Philistines so he could get their clothes. Well, to get the clothes off the dead 30 Philistines, he had to touch 30 dead bodies that he's not supposed to touch as a Nazarite. Again, he's compromising his commitment. <clears throat> but it didn't matter to Samson now. Now, he was just mad because he was publicly humiliated in front of these 30 groomsmen. He wasn't expecting them to win the bet. And now his feelings for romance were replaced by rage and revenge. So basically, Samson leaves his bride standing at the altar and runs off to kill these 30 
Philistines. And leaving his bride at the altar, uh, chapter 14 ends with the father of the bride giving the bride to another man. The best man now becomes, because undoubtedly the father was now somewhat embarrassed, because he's just now thrown this seven day feast. And if he just threw this feast, somebody's going to get married, basically is what he's saying. So, step in, groom, step in, because now this girl's getting married. So, Samson loses his bride as well. Now, when we come to, to chapter 15, we see that Samson, well, now he's decided he wants his bride back after he's walked away. It's a few months later. So, Samson grabs up a goat, a kid, takes it as a gift for his bride. Now, if it were me, I'd probably bring chocolates or flowers, but Samson thinks a goat would do. Let me bring a goat. <laughs> that must win her heart back, right? I'm sure every young lady wants a goat. But <laughs> and when he arrives, though, the father of the bride is not going to let Samson in. He says, I'm not going to let you see this young lady because she's now the wife of somebody else. So, of course, this again makes Samson just a touch upset. He's a little bit mad about this. So in verse 3 of chapter 15, it says, And Samson said concerning them, Now shall I be more blameless than the Philistines, though I do them a displeasure. I like the way they, they're so eloquent with their words. I'm about to really whoop up on some people, but I'm just going to say I'm going to do them a displeasure. But he says I'm blameless in it. He says basically, You've wronged me, so now it's right for me to wrong you. So what does Samson do? Samson gets excited. Again, Samson's more like a college fraternity brother, so what does he do to get back at him? He grabs 300 foxes. He ties their tails two by two, ties their tails together, and in between the two foxes he puts a lit torch and sends them running through the crops of the Philistines. Destroys all their crops. It says in verse 5, it says that he burned up the shocks. The shocks are basically all the wheat they've already cut and stacked up. The standing grain, the, the uh, wheat that was still growing, and the vineyards and the olive groves. Burned up all their crops. And the Philistines only had three cash crops. Three cash crops, which is wheat, olives, and grapes. So Samson basically single-handedly wiped out the economic base of the Philistines of that area. And afterwards... Samson wasn't even finished after he did this. Well, because we see now a cycle of revenge starting here. Well, he can't have his bride, so he's going to burn their crops. Well, now the Philistines want to know who burned their crops. And they say, well, Samson. And, and someone tells the Philistines, well, Samson did it because this man wouldn't let him have his wife. So instead of the Philistines going after Samson, they go burn the bride and, the, and, his, and her family. So they're all burned up, and now that makes Samson even madder. Uh, we can see all this in verse 7. What Samson says to after they burned up his bride. In verse 7 of chapter 15 it says, And Samson said unto them, Though ye have done this, yet will I be avenged of you, and after that I will cease. So I did, you did something, I did something, you did something, I'm going to do something again. And only once I get the last say, then I'm going to stop. That's so basically what Samson's saying here. So we have this cycle of revenge. You know, the only way that, that we can ever see revenge stop is when someone breaks the cycle with forgiveness. And that's always going to be true in our lives as well. Revenge is an ugly, ugly cycle. And it only gets, we see in the story of Samson how it just gets worse and worse and bloodier and more people die and worse things happen as it goes. And in our lives, that's going to happen. We, we'll probably ne- never get to the point where we go burn down someone's house. Hopefully not. I hope no one ever gets that far in their revenge cycle. But the only way you'll ever break a revenge cycle is to offer up forgiveness. We need to remember to be able to offer that forgiveness instead of seeking revenge. Now verse 8 tells us, and, it, and he smote them hip and thigh with a great slaughter. So Samson was pretty upset. He came in and he just slaughtered a whole bunch of people. And later on, because of that, his own people turned him over to the Philistines. You know, when they turned him over to the Philistines, 
as he was turned over to the Philistines, it tells us that Samson found a new jawbone of an ass. Basically, a, a freshly dead, again, here he is touching a dead body again. Um, it seems to be a recurring cycle with Samson here. A fresh jawbone of an ass, and he takes that, and with that he kills a thousand men. Just gets worse and worse for Samson. But actually, at this moment in his life is where we see a little bit, we see that little bit of godliness coming out in him. Just a little bit. Because after he's killed a thousand men, apparently that's a pretty tough work. It's a pretty tough task. So he was pretty thirsty after this was all said and done. And so Samson, in verse 18, we see what his response to this was. In verse 18, And he was sore athirst, and called on the Lord, and said, Thou hast given this great deliverance into the hand of thy servant, and now shall I die for thirst and fall into the hands of the uncircumcised? So here we see Samson, through all his troubles, yet he knew that the best answer was to get down on his knees and pray. So there was a glimpse of godliness in Samson. First of all, he did it right. First of all, he recognizes the fact that it was only because of God that he was able to do these wonderful feats. He acknowledges God and gives God the glory, and then he asks God for deliverance. Now we see that if after this, at the end of verse, at the end of chapter 15, it says, "And he judged Israel in the days of Philistines twenty years." So after he recognized God in his life and prayed to God, he now judged Israel righteously for twenty years. He and. If the story ended there for Samson, Samson would, we would then think Samson is a very successful, wonderful Bible hero. But unfortunately, when chapter 16 opens, we see the old Adamic nature laying dormant in Samson and just waiting to resurface. And in chapter 16, in verse 1, it says, Then went Samson to Gaza and saw there an harlot and went in under her. You know, 20 years of victory, he judged Israel, and it all fell to pieces in one night. One night is all it took. You know, Samson was basically, you could say he was maybe in a midlife crisis. And it reminds us that the natural man never dies within us, and we have to constantly be on guard against the things and the fiery darts of Satan. Because Samson had never really dealt with the problems that plagued him. He never really dealt with his problems of romance and revenge. So here we see him doing something really stupid. A really stupid move for Samson. There's no chance that Samson's going to arrive in Gaza City and not be noticed. Here's the group of the Philistine people. They didn't like Samson very much. They probably contracted out to have him killed, but here he was marching into their capital city. It's almost as if he didn't even really care if he got caught. It's as if he thought he was invincible. And we even see that... uh, in his actions afterwards, that he really did think he was invincible. You know, the word got out that Samson was in Gaza, and the Philistine people gathered around and watched for him. They wanted to kill him. They were going to wait until morning when he came out. But he woke up in the middle of the night instead of waiting until the morning, and he came on out. And instead of just leaving Gaza quietly and slipping out, he was very bold in what he did. He went to the, the main gate of the city, ripped it off the wall, doors and posts and all, and carried it up the hill. We're talking about these cities in this day and age, would have great huge walled cities, and their gates would have been massively made out of wood. And these, these, two, these gates that he ripped off probably would have weighed more than 700 pounds. And he just rips them off and carries them on up the mountain. As he puts it up at the top of the hill... He puts it and faces it towards Hebron. Basically, he faces it towards the Israelite people. It's almost as if he was trying to, to show the Philistines that I can do whatever I want to you. I, I'm invincible. He wanted to humiliate them. He wanted them to feel... Uh, he wanted to take away the symbol of their safety. And he was, it's almost as if he was saying, not only can't you catch me, but I'm going to utterly destroy anything you try and do against me. He was trying to say, I can do anything that I want to do. 
But now Samson was starting down his southward slide again because his problems of lust and revenge had never really gone away. And now add on to those, add on top of problems of, of lust and revenge, add on top of that arrogance and invincibility, and you've got a recipe for trouble. And we can look again here, and here's where we now find him falling in love with Delilah. And we can see in there four different mistakes that Samson makes with his alliance with Delilah. First of all, he gets involved with another wrong relationship. You know, in verse 4 it tells us that Samson fell in love with a woman named Delilah. You know, this is the third woman that's caused him trouble. Each one of them was a Philistine woman. First the woman of Timnah, then the the heart of Gaza, and now Delilah. And we read in here, it says, well, he, he really loves Delilah, though. The other ones, he never really said he loves them. The first woman just pleased him. The second one was just a harlot. This one, now, he loves Delilah, so it must be good, right? Well, just wait. It doesn't get any better. And now we see, the second thing he does is he toyed with temptation. You know, the Philistine rulers who knew all about Samson's fatal flaws, like I said before, Samson's the only one who can't see it, but the Philistine rulers come up with a plan, and in verse 5 it tells us that five of these governors each offered Delilah 1,100 pieces of silver. 1,100 pieces of silver would have been about $140,000, over $140,000 each. And of course this is back before the days of all the... uh, back before the days of all the inflation, so it would have been the equivalent of today of them offering her about $15 million to entice, again, the same word, to placate on the simple-mindedness of Samson. Wanted Wanted her to entice him into showing the secrets of his strength. So we see, of course, Samson's final romance, of course, ends in disaster. Because Samson had given his heart to Delilah. He loved her. And because of that, he gave his heart to her and he was like putty in her hands. I think if my wife had tried to trick me three times, I might catch on. But Samson doesn't catch on. So you have between these two, between the character of Samson and the character of Delilah, you have a very lethal combination. You have Samson's fatal attraction based on sex. You have Delilah's motivation was money. Now you add on to that the Philistines who were after power and you take that trifecta of money, sex, and power and those are never good and it always causes destruction. And that's what we see happening here. But Delilah, of course, agrees to trick him. You know, she did, there's never any question in her mind, let's see, Samson, or $15 million. Mm, I think I'll take the $15 million. There was never a question in her mind what she was going to do. So, and, and each time Samson toyed with her, he got closer and closer to telling her the truth. Now, first he told her that if they bound, and bound him with fresh bowstrings, he would be helpless. Then he said if they tied him up with new ropes. Then he said if you take all the locks of my hair and web them together, then he'd be helpless. See, Samson is feeling really self-confident now. He's letting her get closer and closer to the truth. He's actually letting her touch his hair, which he knows is the true source of his strength. He's thinking he's invincible. So he's toying with temptation. The third thing he does is he reveals his secret in order to save face. Finally, she said unto him in verse 15 of chapter 15, chapter 16, it says, And she said unto him, How canst thou say I love thee when thine heart is not with me? Thou hast mocked me these three times and hast not told me wherein thy great strength lieth. Basically, she's saying, if you really loved me, you'd tell me. Do we see that in our society nowadays? Teenagers saying, if you really love me, you'll do this or you'll do that. That's basically what was happening here. So Samson couldn't let her get away with that. He had to prove that he really loved her. And it also says in verse 16 that she resorted to the war of the words. In verse 16 it says, And it came to pass when she pressed him daily with her words and urged him so that his soul was vexed unto death. Basically she became such a nag that he couldn't take it anymore. Just couldn't take the nagging of this wife of his and he just couldn't stand it so he told her everything. 
you got to look at this and just think, Samson, what an idiot you are. Samson wasn't really tricked. He knew what was going on. You weren't really deceived. She had tried three times, and each time you told her something, she called for the Philistines to come get you, and you just broke free. What would make Samson think that she wouldn't do it again? You know, just like Adam in the the garden. Adam knew exactly what he was doing when he ate of the fruit. Samson knew exactly what he was doing. The rulers of the Philistines came with their silver. Delilah puts him to sleep, calls in a man, and they chop off his hair. He probably didn't realize it was going to happen the way it happened. And that's the fourth fatal flaw. He didn't realize what he had done until it was too late. As soon as he was sound asleep, the man came in, chopped off his hair, and in verse 19 it says plainly, his strength went from him. And the last phrase of verse 20 may be one of the saddest statements in the whole Old Testament. It says there, and he wist not that the Lord was departed from him. He didn't even realize the Lord had walked away from him. How how sad is that? How many people in our society, how many people in this, this city, in this nation, don't realize that the Lord has walked away from them? And how sad is that? He didn't realize what had happened to him. Too many times, even Christians will drift away from God through something stupid, through some folly, and they don't even realize that they've lost their relationship. They may not have lost their salvation, because we know that that is secure, but they've lost their fellowship with God just because of something stupid. And they don't even realize it until it's too late. They don't appreciate that closeness they had until it's gone. Sin will always take you further than you want to go. And what happens next is pretty ugly. You know, the Philistines have been waiting for 20 years to get their revenge on Samson. And verse 21 tells us what happens there. It says in verse 21, But the Philistines took him and put out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza and bound him with fetters of brass and he did grind in the prison house. You know, four things happened to Samson. First, he was mutilated. They gouged out his eyes. His wandering eyes had caused him to wander away from Satan and now he was blind. Then there was deportation. He was taken down to the Gaza city. Taken away from the land of Israel. Put into the heart of of Philistine. Then he was incarcerated. He was bound with bronze shackles. And finally there was humiliation. You know, they set him to grinding in the prison. The grinding in the prison would have been the work for the slaves or the animals to do. But they put him to it. You know, and if we don't recognize and deal with the fatal flaws in our life, we'll end up in the same fate, just like Samson. Blinding, binding, and grinding. Blinding will take place as we lose our moral compass, as we lose our vision. Binding will result as we lose our freedom and liberty, and we'll spend the rest of our lives grinding out some purposeless existence. You know, so how do we avoid Samson's fate? How are we going to have a closer walk with God? That closer walk that we all need, how is that going to happen? First of all, acknowledge your fatal flaws. Find out what your... Each and every one of us knows what our spiritual soft spot is. We know where our weaknesses are. We have to acknowledge that. Secondly, we need to admit that we need help. Until we admit that we're vulnerable, until we admit that we need help, we'll be just like Samson and we'll just deny that we have a problem. Psalms 34, 17 says, The righteous cry out and the Lord heareth and delivereth them out of all their troubles. Third, we need to avoid temptation. We know what our temptations are. Like I said, most of us know what our weaknesses are. Don't put yourself in the situation of your weakness. If you know alcohol is your weakness, stay away from the bars. If you know that lust is your weakness, stay away from the beach. Whatever it is. Stay away from whatever it is that gives you problems. Just stay away from it. Fourthly, ask for help. It's not just enough to acknowledge your problem. You have to, first of all, admit you need some help, and then you have to ask for that help. First and foremost, ask God for His assistance. You know, Samson did this in in Judges in 1628, and he realized he needed help. He asked God. In verse 28 it says, And Samson called unto the Lord and said, O Lord God, remember me, I pray thee, and strengthen me. I pray thee only this once. 
O God, that I may be at once avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. And secondly, after we've asked God and we've gone to God for help, we also need to ask others for help. Find a good Christian friend, a good Christian person that will help you be accountable for the things you do. It's so much more, uh, it's so easier, so much easier to stick with things if we'll share it with someone else. Say, hey, look, I need trouble with this. Can you just check with me once a week, see how you're doing? Because if you know you have to tell somebody that, oh, I messed up, you're less likely to do it. Just someone there to help keep you accountable helps you stay away from those things. And fifthly, we need to assimilate God's truth into our life. How do we assimilate God's truth in our life? Well, we need to make sure we're with God's people. We're reading God's Bible. We're praying to God. In Psalms 119.11 says, Thy word have I hid in mine heart, that I might not sin against thee. You know, we have to stay connected with God, and we have to stay connected with His people. So let's ask a question. I want to ask you one question. How far can a person go before God will not deal with that person anymore? How bad do you have to be before God just says, I'm done with you? Get drunk one time? Is that far enough? If you steal some money, is that far enough? If you end up killing somebody, is that too far? If you cheat on your spouse, is that too far? You know, how far is too far before God says, I'm done with you? I can tell you right now, nobody knows the answer to that question. And why do we not know the answer? Because there never is too far. Corey Ten Boom, after surviving a Nazi prison camp, was asked how she could keep on going when things were so tough. And her answer kind of gives us a glimpse as to God's love. It says, there is no pit so deep that the love of God is not deeper still. You can't get too far away from God to turn back. And when you do, God will be waiting for you. No matter how far away you run from God, you're never too far to come back. God can still find you. You know, that's what Samson realized he had done. He realized he'd gone too far. And there had to be a death to make it right. The same thing is true with our sinful lives. We have to die to our sin. Romans 6.11 says, Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. You know, we need to look at our fatal flaws squarely in the face and count ourselves dead to those flaws and alive to Christ because of what Jesus had done for us. You know, we look at the end of this story and in verse 30 it says, And Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. And he bowed himself with all his might, And the house fell upon the lords and upon all the people that were therein. So the dead which he slew at his death were more than they which he slew in his life. Now you're going to find find it to be true in your life that if you're willing to go back to the place where you disobeyed and you face it and you reckon yourself to be dead to that sin and alive to God, that God is going to take care of the troubles in your life. So the moral of the story, what is the moral of the story? The moral of the story is that it really has nothing to do with Samson, but everything to do with God. You know, this is a living lesson in the grace of God. You know, we see a man who is beaten, who is blinded, who is humiliated by his own stupidity, by his own sins, by his own repeated acts, and he reached rock bottom, and he turned around, and he saw God was waiting for him the whole time waiting and ready for him to just recognize who he needed. There's nothing heroic about Samson. All he did was turn around and find God. God is the hero in this story. So there may be some of us that really need to hear this, some of us that need to restore a relationship with God and understand that that restoration doesn't depend on anything we perform. Samson didn't do any performance. Samson didn't perform until after he came back to God. He wasn't able to knock down the pillars until after he had come back to God. He came back to God when he was still beaten, when he was still shackled, when he was still blind. And he turned back to God, and God took him. So if you've allowed a fatal flaw to interfere with your relationship with God, if you're ready to turn back, then God will be there anxiously waiting for you. Let's stand. Let's be dismissed in the word of prayer.